Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from Interest.co.nz and welcome to another in our series of Double Shot Interviews where we bring in someone interesting to say something interesting about something interesting and property is something that our readers love to talk about. Now, Ollie Newland, who is a property uh, investment uh, expert, has come into the uh, studio here at Interest.co. Welcome back, Ollie. Thank you. And thank you very much for your opinion piece, which has got our readers talking again Pleasure. over the last couple of days. What do you think is happening in the market, not just in Auckland, but in the rest of the country at the moment? I think what is happening is that the people generally have decided that three years of, of uh, hard times is enough and that the, the market has not collapsed as many had predicted. Around the fringes there's been some bad news and they've decided that they're going to get on with it. Interest rates are staying low and look like they're going to stay low for a long period. So people have decided that uh, this is as bad as, as it's going to get, so they're getting back into the market. The isn't, figures, this, isn't this just about very low interest rates? It is partly because of low interest rates, but remember New Zealand has always had a history of high interest rates, and we've finally come down to interest rates which are comparable, roughly speaking, to the rest of the world. And I think we're in for a long period of low interest rates. But isn't there a danger people could be caught out when interest rates rise again? Well, or are you saying that they won't rise? I'm saying that it's, as things are at the moment, interest rates are likely to go down even further. I see no prospect of interest rates rising in the near future on the facts that we know at the moment. Uh, just imagine if interest rates went back to where they were three or four years ago, half of New Zealand would be in the street. It's as simple as that. So uh, I think we're in for a long period of low interest rates. One of the risks is that if the Reserve Bank sees house prices rising again, particularly in, in some sort of hot fashion, it might jump in there and say, hey, this is too hot for us, let's put up interest rates. That, that could happen. The Reserve Bank seems to run on different rails from you and me, uh, so they're capable of doing anything. They've got it wrong up until now, and they're quite likely to get it wrong again. So I'm afraid all bets are off when it comes to what the Reserve Bank does. Now, looking at uh, supply, you've talked about um, the issues around uh, particularly first home buyers yeah. and GST. What's your view on that? Well, it seems to me ridiculous that a first home buyer, if he wants to buy a new house, underline new house, uh, has to pay up to perhaps 60, 70,000 in GST on every nail, every blade of grass, every every brick and, and, and piece of furniture in the place. Uh, this is a huge disincentive to the builders, alone, let alone to the to the buyers. Yet they can go, uh, the first time buyer can go down the road and buy a second hand house and there's no GST in it. And in my view, we should do something similar to the Australians have a rebate on, on, on stamp duty, is rebate GST for first home buyers who buy a new home underline new home. Isn't this just another subsidy there for the residential property well, market? Well it is, yes it is, and, uh, there's no such thing as black and white, but just think of the benefits, it would encourage the building industry which has been lying on its back the last three years, and it would get people onto the property ladder, which is a good thing, get them out of a renting situation, so there are big spin-offs, and it's only a one time, one off. What, what about the idea though that if lots of people come in, if there was a, a rebate on GST, you'd see a lot more new houses built? And that might drag down the price of housing because you'd had a lot more supply on the market. Well, isn't that what some people want? They want prices to come down or stabilise. So if we can supply more of something, that's the old rule. If you supply more of something, it gets cheaper. So if you can supply more new houses in the, in the cheaper end of the market, it'll help keep prices down. One thing we're going to see later this week is the Productivity Commission's report on housing affordability on Friday, which you referred to in your uh, comment piece. Uh, what are the options there for the authorities to change the housing affordability uh, outlook? Well, we just mentioned one with regard to GST. The other one is to make rentals more readily available. We've got disincentives out there at the moment for investors to supply rental accommodation. And there are all sorts of disincentives. The ones that have been re recently reduced, such as the depreciation, uh, introduced rather, such as the depreciation uh, disallowance, and also long-term uh, disincentives, such as the Rent Appeal Authority. Why is the Rent Appeal Authority a problem for rental and property The Rent owners? Appeal Authority is set up uh, really, it, it favours tenants over landlords. Uh, in particular, it restricts the amount of rent that you can do or the rent reviews you can do and also the amount of bond you can you can charge. And the damage that a tenant can do to a property far exceeds the, usually the bond that is available. And I can't see why people can't opt out of, of uh, the tenancy agreement and charge whatever bond the market can be it, with, with some limitations. Uh, so what type of bond should rental property investors be charging if there were no rules? It should be related to the value of the property. 
it seems ridiculous if somebody's renting a $3 million property that they're still limited to, to a bond uh, of, say, a couple of weeks or something like that, uh, when the damage could be run into hundreds of thousands. It, it, it's a bit daft. So what would what sort of bond would you charge? Because if you've got a $3 million house and someone trashes it, that could be, you know, um, by the time you look at insurance uh, uh, um, uh, premiums uh, and the, the, um, the pr issue of uh, paying out a, an upfront fee for the insurance, that could be tens of thousands of dollars. Well, no one's going to pay a bond that much. Well, I don't think there should be any control at all. I just think it's just whatever you can negotiate. In the commercial market, in the commercial property market, you can negotiate any bond you like whether one month, two months, three months rent in advance, or call it what you like, held as a bond. There's no limit at all. Now, the other issue is um, around the area of term deposits. You raised the idea in your opinion piece that there should be inflation indexing for term deposits. And this is an idea that's been put forward uh, out of the um, savings working group and was talked about in the, in the tax working group as well. In this, in this case, you would see a return from your term deposit which uh, where the, the, the part that was related to inflation wasn't taxed. And um, that's one way of doing it. Why, why do you think that's a good idea? Well, in the property market, you need borrowers and you need lenders to the banks. And the people that are coming to see me as, as an authorised financial advisor complain that when they put money in the bank and say get 5% as a, as a number, less tax, so they end up with say 3.5%, less inflation, which is say 2%, they're ending up with zip, frankly. And uh, they're saying, well, why should we leave our money in the bank? We might as well go and buy a property and get a chance of a better return and a chance for capital growth. So it wouldn't hurt to have uh, indexed, it's been done before, have indexed deposits so that it keeps up with inflation and gets a true return for people. So it encourages savers up to a point and encourages lending to banks who in turn can lend to borrowers. But one of the uh, arguments that people who invest in rental property is that they get a much better return from rental property from the tax-free capital gains and the uh, maybe not the rental returns than they would from money in a term deposit. Wouldn't this make rental property less attractive relatively than term deposits if they were indexed well, for inflation? There's balance everywhere. It's not quite like that. People invest in rental property for a lot of reasons and one of them of course is, is but the hope of capital growth, the control of it, the fact that there's always a, a chance for better rent increases, there are minor tax advantages, of course, and the fact that you have, as I mentioned before, total control over it, and not just some anonymous deposit in the bank somewhere. Uh, it's, it's just the culture of the nature uh, of the nation, and it's the culture around the world, frankly. People, people perhaps rent or they buy, but somebody owns the property somewhere, so you've got to encourage people to invest in property somewhere down the line, either for renters or, or, or for themselves. One thing put forward by the Greens in the last few weeks is that we see, we need, they say, a lot more state house building. What's your view on that? Well, what they're saying is that the government, you and me, and, uh, as taxpayers, should pay for other people who are too lazy to buy their own house. Now, there are people out there who definitely need state house or government help, and I'm the first to, to say that's the case. But it should not be the only source for, for housing. Uh, I think it's quite wrong to build lots more state houses for a lot more a lot of budgets to go into when there are genuine people who need state houses. Um, but wouldn't don't we have a real problem with supply of housing in this country, we which do. the private sector doesn't seem to be meeting? We yeah. seem to have supply shortages in. Well, why? You've got the supply shortage because there's such disincentives for the, for the private sector. Couldn't you argue that we have supply shortages because houses are overvalued and land is overvalued and therefore you can't actually afford to build it yourself? I would agree that prices of houses are overvalued to a certain degree. What happened in the last boom is prices got ahead of themselves. Now they're catching up and in a year or two they'll be perfectly, perfectly level again and we'll have another boom somewhere down the line, I'm sure. Uh, so there's no such thing as, as prices and, and house prices and, and the market being in parallel the whole time. Because The Economist says that uh, New Zealand's house prices are 25% overvalued when you compare them to incomes and to rents. What's you, your view on that? Well, you tell that to the people who bought the, the shoebox apartments and have lost three quarters of the value, or the people who bought uh, some section by some mosquito-infested lake, and tell them if, if they've got a 25% overvalued property. Uh, th this is a nonsense. You, you have to, the property market is not one homogenous thing. It's, it cre it's created out of all sorts of things. There's sections, there's houses, there's, there's um, apartments, there's farms, there's orchards, there's lifestyle blocks, there's beach houses. There's all sorts of things. It's not just one lump. And the other area that's interesting in the last few weeks is that 
uh, we've seen um, some real turmoil in Europe, and you refer to it in your co column that there's all these, you know, sayers of doom who yeah. say, you know, it's all going to go pear-shaped. But, but you're arguing that this is no different to what we've seen before. We'll bounce back, we'll have growth, well, and that eventually we, we, we will. But surely it is different this time, and that the growth just doesn't seem to be um, coming yeah. back. The growth isn't coming back as, as we would like, it's true. But one gets a little bit passe, if you like, bored with the constant crises. There's one crisis after another, after another, after another, and after a while you say, well, you know, bring me something fresh, <laughs> because they, they seem to be solving these crises. The European crisis seems to have come and moved off a little bit, uh, and, and I don't know what the next crisis is going to be. So in, in the end, uh, people get uh, immune to one crisis after another. I, I think these crises are slightly overdone. Hmm. Oh, well, we'll see how we go over the next few <laughs> few months. Best wishes for the Christmas break, Thank Ollie, you. Thank and we'll look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you. I'm Bernard Hickey for interest.co.nz. That was another in our double shot interviews with Ollie Newland, a property investment expert on interest.co.nz.